It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is David Ross. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry LeSeur and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Gabriel Hauge, economic advisor to the president. It goes without saying that it's difficult to get an appointment with the president of the United States. But few persons see President Eisenhower more often than our guest tonight. He has a set date at the White House at 11 o'clock every Monday morning. He goes there and keeps the president informed of the economic pulse rate of the nation. Now, Dr. Hauge, the president has reported that the recession of, or the business downturn of last year or in the early part of this year is over and that uh, he predicts that the next months will see a business upturn. Could you tell us on what he bases these calculations? Yes, Ms. Lesur. Yesterday, the president uh, put out a statement, as you know, in which he said that, in his opinion, the, the slump, the recession, the adjustment, whatever you want to call it, that's been going on since uh, about the middle of last year had come to a halt. I think his confidence is based on things like this, hard facts. The uh, level of construction and the perspective level of construction, the very satisfactory performance of retail sales, the business expenditures on plant and equipment, which create jobs and create demand for heavy goods and for the metal industries. The strength of the financial markets. The fact that inventories, which have been very heavy and have had to be adjusted downward over these months, are now getting into better shape with respect to sales. I think things like that, hard facts in the business situation, have given him reason for cautious optimism. Well, Dr. Hauge, isn't it true, though, that the Unemployment situation is worse now than it has been for several years. Is, this, is there any assurance that these fellows are going to get their jobs back? Well, this matter of unemployment, uh, the president also considered yesterday in his statement, uh, Mr. Lesseur. He pointed out that unemployment now, at something over three million, is up from what it was a year ago. It is, however, lower than it was in 1949 and 1950. And also he pointed out that the increase in unemployment has been brought to a stop and that, uh, that employment has been rising steadily. And out of these facts, he thinks that when fall comes, we'll begin to get a good attack on that unemployment figure. Well, Dr. Hauge, does this administration think that the present level of unemployment is necessary to the economic health of the nation? Indeed not, uh, Mr. Burdett. Uh, the present level of unemployment, which though it is moderate in comparison with previous uh, levels of unemployment, uh, is more than the economy needs uh, or can usefully have with respect to uh, a good level of employment. I would think that it's at least a million higher than uh, uh, any uh, normal kind of unemployment or whatever you want to call it. Dr. Hauge, is it possible to avoid uh, political bias when uh, making reports to the president? Is it possible to paint uh, a, an economy of a political in administration in anything but the most roseate colors? Well, uh, the people who have the responsibility of uh, telling the president what the true picture is uh, certainly have to be on guard. Uh, any doctor who deliberately misreads the thermometer or uh, the electrocardiograph is not going to be very much help to the uh, people he's working for. The uh, facts are presented to the president. The advice that comes to him from political advisors, whether he among his congressional associates or his cabinet associates, in connection with the evaluation of the total economic picture, is of course something that uh, then must be made. But the president himself is a hard shooter for facts, and that's the way that he puts them out to the people. Well, you wouldn't you say so, if I may, Winston, wouldn't you say that it would be very difficult for the president to uh, make a prediction that things were going to, were very bad and they were going to get worse? Wouldn't he have to put it in the the best possible light, political light? Well, I think President Eisenhower, uh, in any particular situation such as this, would adduce the facts like he did yesterday in his report to the people. And uh, these uh, reports from government sources are available to everybody. 
And I think that uh, yesterday in his statement, he used these facts and uh, indicated that in his opinion, these facts meant certain things about the economy. And as far as I can tell from the reaction, uh, people generally have agreed with it. Sir, how great a personal interest does the president evince in economic problems? Well, I'm glad to respond to that question, Mr. Burdett. Uh, I recall uh, in 1952, uh, people used to say about the president that, well, uh, here's a military man. What does he really know about the problems of the country? I first met the president uh, to be in uh, the summer of 1952. And in the conversations we had about economic matters, I was immediately impressed with how much he knew about foreign economic affairs, about the economies of other countries, and also he, uh, how much he knew about industrial mobilization problems in connection with war. Today, I would be willing to assert flatly that there are few people with whom you or I could sit down who could go as deeply and wisely into the problems of agriculture, into the problems of resource use, into the problems of many aspects of our economy than the president. I think it's extraordinary how, how uh, he has mastered the, this tremendous range of problems and uh, brought to bear in his own judgment, uh, now a, a wide uh, range of information. Well, you were talking about, uh, te in technical terms before, Dr. Hauge, about uh, inventory recessions, and we've in the past heard of overproduction and underconsumption. But how much does psychology actually play in the uh, economy of the country, and is it possible to control the psychology of the buyer or the producer? I think psychology is a very important uh, matter. After all, in our kind of an economy, the decisions to buy are made by millions of individuals and by millions of farmers, by millions of businessmen who produce things. Uh, whether or not they elect to spend their money or go into debt to buy something is dependent upon their judgment of what the future is going to be like. Can they sell what they make? Can they liquidate their debts? Psychology is tremendously important. And therefore, uh, the period that we went through, I think, uh, in the first half of this year, when there were tremendous fears uh, in certain areas that we were going to grind our way down into a depression, that frightened certain people. I think now, however, that we're more and more people are emerging from their economic storm cellars. They believe the president when he says that the road ahead looks like it can be a good road for us if we do the right things. So, Dr. Hagee, which is more important, the psychology of the businessman who might order things from a factory or the psychology of a consumer who might or might not want to buy? Well, the consumer, of course, in the aggregate is a bigger spender than uh, uh, businessmen in terms of uh, purchases of plant and equipment uh, several times over. And therefore, in the aggregate, uh, if uh, consumers went on strike, or if consumers uh, indulged in a buying orgy, such as they did after Korea broke in 1950, you get profound effects. But it is necessary in our kind of an economy, I think, Mr. Lesseur, for that section of our total spending, the section uh, that we identify as uh, business spending on plant and equipment, which runs now around $27, $28 billion a year, which is perhaps small compared to consumer spending of upwards of 10 times that much. But it is very important for the demand for the heavy goods industries and for the workers who work in those industries that the psychology of the people who have to commit funds, who have to spend on those things, is a confident one and is a buoyant one. Well, speaking of the heavy goods industry, how much of a role does defense play in the economy of the country, in the business cycle? Well, defense, of course, in the last several years has been a big taker of uh, labor and of materials in this economy. In the past year, this has been declining. And certainly that was one of the items which had to be taken into account in the adjustment that we have been having. We are undoubtedly going to go ahead and have reasonably high levels of defense expenditure compared to anything we knew before World War II. And it's going to play a role, but I think it's going to be a much more steady role, unless, of course, the Russians make a mistake and push us into war. What do you foresee for the rest of this year? A slow climb or a sudden surge? I would expect, Mr. Burdett, that uh, with the resumption of activity in the fall, according to a typical seasonal pattern that's existed for many, many years, we ought to see a steady resumption of activity re-employment, increasing production, 
of a more stable kind, perhaps, than has typically marked the surges of activity up and down in the history of this country in the last 20 years. Well, Dr. Hogg, the, uh, let's face it, everyone, every economist was very optimistic in 1929, and recently they have made predictions which have fallen wide of the mark. Some said there were going to be recessions, some said there didn't. How can we actually be sure that, uh, in looking ahead to the future, that we aren't completely wide of the mark, and there may be a tremendous boom or a tremendous bust? Well, you know, somebody said once that if you'd lay all the economists end to end, they wouldn't reach a conclusion. And I think that perhaps you will find economists are having different views about the future. I think the majority of people who follow this closely today, however, have gotten over the depression uh, jitters of uh, six months ago. And uh, now the debate rather is the rate at which we're going to grow uh, over the next uh, period ahead. I said, well, how much of a role, uh, Dr. Haugerty, does the federal government actually play? Can you create a, an inflation or a deflation, or is that up to the businessman and the consumer? The federal government, of course, if it wants to pursue uh, radically altered policies, such as trying to, uh, for example, unbalance its budget very rapidly by billions of dollars of spending in various ways and by pursuing an exceedingly um, unwise monetary policy, I think could, con could make an inflation rather quickly. And similarly, if it wanted to pursue uh, monetary policies and budgetary policies of a radically constricted, uh, restrictive type, could have a profound e effect. But I think, by and large, the uh, economy of America is increasingly going to be uh, dominated and directed by the millions of Americans all throughout this land who are confident about the future and whose decisions are going to aggregate into a growing, reasonably stable economy and if the, uh, if, the, if the government can pursue right policies in that area, I think we're going to have a fine period ahead. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hauge. It's been very interesting to have you here tonight. Well, the opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Gabriel Hauge, economic advisor to the president. A Longines watch is one of the most perfectly functioning mechanisms made by man. On first acquaintance, one is astonished by its day-to-day -day performance. As months pass into years, its qualities of greater accuracy and reliability become truly priceless. These persuasive words are backed by facts. In competition with the finest watches of all the world, Longines watches alone have won highest honors. Ten World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals are some of these honors. Now, for greater accuracy, Longines watches have won countless honors from great government observatories, highest honors, too, in sports, aviation, and science. In a watch, the best costs but little more than the least. Longines watches are not as costly as you might think. You may choose from many beautiful Longines models for both ladies and gentlemen for as little as $71.50. So, if your present watch is not what it should be, or if you are planning to buy a watch as an important gift, these are facts to remember. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is David Ross, speaking for vacationing Frank Knight, and reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.